something is a little crazy, outside the norm, crazy, an extremist, or being obsessed. Crazy, you know, some crazy theological notions are being discussed today. Like, God stands on the side of the oppressed. Ooh, crazy. Or, God can call women. Crazy. Or, God loves gay people and straight people and transgender people. Crazy. Here's, here's a big one. Sex is not a sin. Woo! <laughs> In our text today, the established authority of the day, the scribes, confront the new authority, Jesus, and attempt to discredit him by accusing him of being possessed by demons and just crazy. So to understand this situation, let's put this into the context of Jesus' life. So according to Luke, he was born in Bethlehem, but grew up in the village of Nazareth. Now, scholarship informs us that in Jesus' day, Nazareth had a population of about 150, most of whom were interrelated. And the Nazarites, or Nazareths, Nazarenes, were a small sect of Jews who believed that they were the shooter, the netzer from the stump of Jesse from whom the promised Messiah would come. And they followed the teachings of this very revered rabbi. And they were strictly orthodox and ultra-conservative. They had as little to do with the outside world as possible, much like the Hasidic Jews of today. So while we don't know all the details of Jesus' early life, we do know that when John the Baptist was in prison, Jesus stepped forward and announced his ministry. And Mark says, now after John was taken into custody, Jesus came to Galilee preaching the good news of the kingdom of God, saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the good news. He spoke in the synagogue of Nazareth and created an uproar. He created an uproar because he was saying crazy things like, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim the release of the captives, recovering sight to the blind, and to deliver those who are crushed. And then he went on to prophesy about God's judgment upon Israel. This was not what people wanted to hear. They dragged him out of the synagogue. They took him to the edge of town where they were prepared to stone him to death. But this time, they stopped short of stoning Jesus. Jesus was able to just walk away. And then they moved to another city, Capernaum. Here things were a little bit different. The synagogue was more open to this radical teaching. Mark says they were astonished at his teaching. For he taught them as having authority, not like the scribes. He even won the loyalty of some local fishermen, Peter and Andrew and James and John, and even a local tax collector, Matthew as well as seven more disciples. And he also had this, this power to heal the sick and to perform all sorts of miracles. But as you know, any time with rising popularity come what we say in the common vernacular, come your haters. Note that even Jesus had haters. With his popularity came mounting criticism. 
His teaching wasn't like anything they've heard before, and he was breaking the laws of ritual cleanliness, and he violated the Sabbath, and he spoke openly of a kingdom, not of this world. And he had the nerve to say that he communicated directly with God. He had to be a little crazy, a possessed or something. Now, even though they criticized him, even his critics couldn't believe that he was casting out good spirits. That's what made it so frustrating because he was healing people and restoring them to health. He just wasn't going about it in a very authorized manner. He was simply doing what needed to be done in such an unorthodox way. It caused chaos. When I was reading this text, the image kept coming in my mind of the Black Panther Party whose founder had a PhD in social philosophy, who initiated in January of 1969 a free breakfast program for children when he connected their lack of proper nutrition with intellectual and academic achievement, setting up kitchens across the US, feeding over 10,000 people in all over the nation before they went to school every day. They said he was crazy. When he stood against police brutality and professed black people have, let me say it, an NRA philosophy of self-defense, even against corrupt governments. Crazy. Or I thought about John Brown, the abolitionist who settled his family in a black community, destroying the notion of racial superiority and the result of separation as being normative, who is still portrayed as being crazy, irrational, a fanatic, because he crossed the line of racial separation at what was deemed appropriate protest and dissent. He was willing to sacrifice his life for the cause of a people forced into servitude. And for this, in a culture that was simply marinated in racism, he was called, and still is called, absolutely mad. But this is what the world has always done to those who question institutional power. That's what the world does to those who seek to change their identifiers, who seek to lift up the oppressed. Looking back to our ancient texts, we see that the more things change, the more they stay the same. Even in my lifetime, I have learned that the world loves to kill prophets, to call them crazy. It shoots them, it hangs them from trees, it nails them to crosses. Their truth has to be silent, for so often it speaks truth to power and empowerment to the disenfranchised. So in today's text, we have Jesus who was healing the sick, restoring people to community, telling people that are convinced that because they are not Roman, they are less than, they are inferior, they are meant to be conquered. Telling people that Caesar, the government, the military is not your God, but the Almighty, telling them that the kingdom, the peace of God is within you and not found in gathering things. He must be crazy. Now Jesus deflects their accusations skillfully, saying that Satan 
wouldn't destroy his own handiwork. But wait a minute, Jesus' family is outside, probably listening to his teaching sounding so crazy to them. And when it becomes clear that he has no intention of conforming to the expectations of the religious leaders and knowing the consequences, they began to say, Mark 3 and 21, he is insane. Now, we know there's a thin line between sanity and insanity. And when it appeared even to his friends and family that he had gone over the edge, they sent word to Nazareth, where he came from, where he was born. Hey, tell Jesus' mother and his brothers, they're outside. Now most likely by this time, Joseph, his father, is no longer living, and Jesus' sisters were married and had families of their own, so it fell to his mother and his brothers to come and take him home. I mean, the last thing any family needs is a religious fanatic who not only disturbs the peace, but is bringing all this attention to the family. And when they got there, they found Jesus teaching in a home, and the place was packed. Mary and her sons, they couldn't get in. So they sent word, tell the teacher, tell the rabbi, that his mother and his brothers are here. But when Jesus gets the message, he says, who are my mother and my brothers? And then looking at the crowd, he said, behold, my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of God, the same is my brother and my sister and my mother. Well, when Mary and the others were told what he said, they just turned away and went back to Nazareth. Who are my mother and my brothers? What do you make of that? On the surface, it seems a little harsh. I mean, does this mean he was rejecting his family altogether? Well, in his book, The New Being, theologian Paul Tillich points out that Jesus did not say those outside are not my mother and my brothers. In other words, he did not deny the relationship he had with his biological family. He merely expanded the family circle to include any number of others. He pointed to a spiritual rather than a biological kinship as the basis for life in the kingdom of God. Paul echoes these sentiments when he writes to the Romans, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the children of God. The implication is if we are sons and daughters of God, then brothers and sisters of one another. I believe this is what John Fawcett had in mind when he penned the words, Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. The Spirit of God unites us as a family. It transcends boundaries of age and race and nationality and gender. It encompasses folk from every station and walk of life. And it gives us the courage to be a little bit crazy, to speak truth to power. The last couple of days, I was with some of us here. I attended the Illinois Conference of the United Church of Christ, and I was reminded that this is the church of extravagant welcome. This is the church where a lot of the crazy people reside. <laughs> and here in today's text, this is where the point of extravagant welcome is made in the spirit of our faith. Our family circle is expanded. Our relationships are extended. Our boundaries are stretched to include all who believe. 
the creator of all that was and all that is to be. So this crazy, unorthodox Jesus says, who is my family? Who do I really belong to? One thing that makes Jesus so radical is because he came to break the bonds of exclusivity in relationships. I mean, he dismantled the claim, the exclusive claim, that only the Jews were God's chosen people. That everyone was a child of God. That's crazy. And affirmed, I belong to God, and therefore, those who do the will of my spiritual parent is my family. He broke the chains of the concept that biology is the only way to unite people. Radical. Sounds crazy. What do you, what do you say? Like, that our family is not just those who look like us? Or not just those who live like us? Or not just those who dress like us? Could they even cover their heads and their bodies? Could those be our brothers and sisters? And not just those from the same place as us. Sounds a little crazy, doesn't it? That is the tradition we stand in. People who are labeled crazy and are crazy making for the world. So the question stands for us today. Are you willing to be called crazy as we work into learning how to live into new ways of being and belonging? Amen.